Learning Ally is a proud sponsor of the Empowered Dyslexia podcast. Learning Ally, a nonprofit education organization, helps to transform the lives of struggling learners by delivering proven solutions that help students reach their potential. We have a heritage of supporting students with a reading deficit like dyslexia. Our award-winning Human Red audiobook solution helps students in grades 3 through 12 access books they want and need to read to help them succeed. Visit www.learningally.org for more information. Hello world, wake me up to another good, good morning. Hello and welcome to Empower Dyslexia. I'm your host, Stephen Yearout, and on this program, we're here to help you be a better informed partner in education. We speak about dyslexia and other related disorders. We speak about research, we speak about in intervention, we speak about special education policy at the state, local, and federal level. We interview experts in their fields. My favorite part is we speak to people with personal experience, personal stories about growing up and dealing with learning disabilities. Please be sure to subscribe to us on our Facebook channel and YouTube. Leave us comments, leave us um, likes, and it helps us with our YouTube uh, algorithm. And we are on all the different platforms that you get your favorite um, audio podcasts. If you like to watch uh, Empower Dyslexia, we're Facebook Live, YouTube Live. And the newest thing that we have now, we have our own app on Amazon TV. So you can go on your Fire Stick and type in Empower Dyslexia and we're there. So make sure that you, again, subscribe, review, leave us a comment, let us know how we're doing. So today we have a very special guest, uh, my good friend Clarice Jackson from Nebraska. She's an amazing woman. She's a fierce advocate. Um, I mean, she is somebody that I, I say that I'm proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with in this fight to make sure that we have literacy for all. We make sure that all of our kids are educated. Um, the topic today is high tides raise all ships. And this is really when we're talking about education. So Clarice, welcome to welcome back to Empower Dyslexia. Thank you so much, Stephen, and thank you for that gracious introduction. Um, I too am happy and honored to to know you, to to know the passion behind the work that you do uh, for dyslexia and literacy for all students and just having this platform that is uh, open to everyone to come and share and discuss what they're doing surrounding this important topic. So I appreciate you having me on your show again. Absolutely. So can you give our viewers and listeners a little more information about who is Clarice and what is she doing in Nebraska? Okay, well, who is Clarice Jackson? I think that Clarice Jackson is always evolving, um, but there are some key pieces of who I am that will always remain. And one of those things is I am a huge proponent of equitable education for all, uh, specifically in the area of literacy and or dyslexia. I have the lived experience of being the parent of a child who has dyslexia and navigating that system and trying to figure out uh, what exactly was prohibiting my daughter from, from learning to read, even though there wasn't anything cognitively wrong with her. She still struggled severely and was illiterate uh, up into the fourth grade. So that's what got me on the path um, specifically for literacy, but education has always been a part of my being since my, my beginning years. Um, through my experience with my daughter, I uh, became a special education advocate voluntarily, and I did have done that in a capacity, um, that capacity as a volunteer 
for about 20 years. And then in 2012, I decided um, through um, what I, I, I feel was a divine uh, revelation from the Lord to me to open up Voice Advocacy Center here in Omaha, Nebraska, which was the first dyslexia screening, tutoring, and special education advocacy center in the state of Nebraska. My daughter at that time was about 22 years old, but yet the same struggles and fights and concerns that I was undertaking many, many years prior were still the same stories that parents that I was currently helping were dealing with, mainly with trying to, to figure out why their child couldn't read. And so I knew it would take a long time, unfortunately, for us to get schools to recognize and to address dyslexia. And I knew that children had, they didn't have any more time to waste or wait. And so a voice advocacy center was an answer to the prayers of parents who were looking for support and looking for help for their students while we traversed the legislative platform and the educational uh, systemic system uh, uh, that has not used structured literacy. So that's why Voice Advocacy Center exists and still remains here in operation. I decided um, last year after um, several things that I wasn't doing enough to ensure that literacy was equitable for all. I thought just by simply saying that uh, we must raise the bar and we must be conscious about what curriculums, approaches, or methods we're using in schools to teach children was enough. But I have found that um, there is an unconscious sometimes system, inequitable system that is still at work and it has been at work since uh, post-slavery um, that does not equate to a fairness in literacy for all students, even though most people who are out here advocating for literacy laws or structured literacy or dyslexia teaching and training and screening in schools, um, you would think that when they say that they want that for all students, that that means that, but it doesn't. And so I have created a program called, um, a campaign actually called the Black Literacy Matters Campaign, because for Black and Brown students who are illiterate or who struggle with dyslexia, that is not always the case. Um, whether we have organizations such as Decoding Dyslexia, who I'm the founder of Decoding Dyslexia Nebraska, and I uh, work for uh, my own organization to do that, um, it still does not help students who are, dis who are black and brown, who are dyslexic or who struggle with literacy. So black um, literacy matters. Um, it has been launched by me. Um, we have a website and a Facebook page and it is designed to address the disproportionality issues that persist in education when it comes to literacy and the achievement gap. And the fact that um, in the state of Nebraska, locally, um, only 12% of fourth graders in the entire state that are Black students are, liter are, are functionally literate, meaning they're, they're just making minimum standards of proficiency. And that rate so, is... So say, say that number again. Only, sorry, let me, let me say it again. I apologize. So in the state of Nebraska, the whole entire state, fourth grade literacy scores for fourth graders are only 15%. And that score decreases in the eighth grade for black students. They are only making, they're only, they're only 12, they're only 12% of eighth grade black students are literate. And, and we know from NAEP scores from 2019 yes. that 64% yes. of fourth 
eighth and 12th graders don't read on grade level. And that reading levels in the United States have been flat for almost 30 years or declining. Uh, last year, uh, 2019, uh, was, the, was the first year in a while that we actually had declining reading scores. Yes, yes. So, I mean, yes. these, these numbers matter. They matter. They absolutely matter, Stephen. And the, the, the scores that I just gave you for the state of Nebraska, they were from the NAEP scores. They were from 2019. Yeah. And we, we all lived through the pandemic and are currently trying to see our way out of it. And so we already know the research that has been done about what, what does it look like for our students who have been out of school for a very, very long time, who have been traversing um, <clears throat> virtual learning, which for students with learning disabilities, such as dyslexia, that has been very difficult. And, and a lot of students have really suffered because that's not the best educational environment for them to learn from. And so we, we, we know that there are going to be uh, educational setbacks, but there, the setbacks already exist and existed prior to this. So, for, so I'll, I'll make an argument that you said that, that we know that there's going to be setbacks. Mm -hmm. The setbacks are already there and have been there for a long time. And if you know, I, I don't buy into, well, this is just my own personal opinion, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to um, buy into the COVID slide or the summer slide or any of these other slides that we want to talk about. Because if the concept was taught to at least a proficient level, if not a mastery level, Mm -hmm. there's not going to be a slide. If those kids truly know how to read, write, spell, do math, yes, there's not going to be, or the slide is so, so small that we're not going to be looking at what we're looking at today. And, and, you know, we were sitting here talking about numbers and the people that are listening and watching to, uh, these shows, the reason why the advocates speak in percentages and numbers because the like I said the numbers matter and the parents I I want you to go out and look at the NAEP scores I want you to go to your state education uh, commission pull down any data that you can on literacy levels math level any of this stuff understand what the data says use the your your state scores so you understand what is going on in your education system. Parents, you are paying for this education. And unfortunately, right now, we're paying for failure. We absolutely are. And you, you bring a valid point to light, Stephen. And, and I'm so glad that you, you said that. It's imperative that you don't leave the education of your student in the hands of teachers and principals and, and people who are relaying information to you. And I say that not to villainize all educators or all administrators, but I say that um, with deep uh, concern that anyone can present information in a way that puts it in a better light. And so you will have things that are placed in your paper by your school systems. You will have teachers sit before you in an IEP meeting, which I've been in many, where they're saying, oh, your child is doing wonderful. I literally sat in an IEP meeting um, not too long ago, um, but this has happened before as well, where a parent was told by the administrator, by the psychologist, by the general ed teacher, that their child who had dyslexia was making great strides. And it happened to be at the uh, three-year renewal of the IEP. And me looking at the IEP from three years prior to the one that they were trying to present today, it showed me that the child had made no progress, that the child had not the program that they were using was not working and that this child was still reading on a pre-K level and was now in the third grade. But yet 
the people that were sitting before this parent, understanding that this parent does not understand how to read this data or probably hasn't looked into that, lied to them. So I, I want everybody to hold on to that third grade reading level and this child reading at a pre-K level because that, that's going to come back. And another important point to what you're talking about is the parent not being able to read the information that they're giving them. When you, and I tell this to parents all the time in school systems, uh, school districts, when you're speaking to a parent of a child who is dyslexic or has a learning disability, the chances of you speaking to somebody with dyslexia at that point or a learning disability is pretty high. Yes, it is. So it is the school's responsibility also to make sure that that parent understands the information that is being delivered to them. That's very and, true. And for us as a parent, we have to make sure that when we go into these rooms, when these IEP meetings or 504 meetings or whatever you have, that you understand the data as well or better than anybody sitting in that room. Because this is your child that they are trying to tell you one way or the other. You have to understand what progress looks like, what good progress looks like, what should happen. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of times, nobody in the room really understands what progress looks like or should look like. They don't. And, and, and the sad part is, you know, even in what you said, there are so many other variables that get added to that. One, most parents, unless they've had a traumatic experience or they've gotten to a place where they, they now understand that, unfortunately, what they perceive the school to be uh, for their student educationally does not exist or is not operating as such. So the variables in that whole scenario are one, does the parent of this child believe that school is the place where if my child is struggling academically, that, that they, will, they will have the answers. And so if the parent believes or perceives that to be true, then the level of trust in what they deem as a professional is saying is very strong for them. And so they perceive them to be the ones with knowledge that know the answers. And so they will yield to that and they will believe that, which was the situation with this parent who, like you said, Stephen, the child had dyslexia, the mother struggled to read, she had dyslexia, it was not officially diagnosed, but you know, based on um, the characteristics that she expressed to me, uh, her struggling to get a GED and always feeling the literacy piece of it, she probably had dyslexia as well. And so she trusted the school system. She trusted the principal and the teachers because they went to college. They are the experts to tell her the truth and they weren't. Well, so, and, and even on top of that, you know, this isn't an Omaha problem or this isn't a Nebraska problem, right? Because here, here in Texas, I talk to parents all the time that they have, they have been begging and pleading to get their kid tested or just to figure out what is going on. Don't care how we do it, just figure out what's going on with my child. And yeah. once somebody validates that, hey, <clears throat> excuse me, once somebody validates and says, yes, your child has a learning disability. That validation, a lot of times, the parent goes, finally somebody's listening to me, and then they relinquish all of that control back over to the people who are sitting across the table for them instead of asking more questions. That's true. Being an advocate for your child means you have to ask not only questions, but the hard questions. When something isn't working, you need, to, you need to bring it to light. Hey, why isn't this working? Why is this, this, and this? You have to ask the questions. And if they don't know, don't take just a random answer. Uh, we call it trust but verify. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're going to tell me something, 
I'm going to go make sure that that statement is true. Just like if I tell somebody something, I want them to go out and research it and see if what I'm saying is true. Because I promise you it is. I've done the research on it. And so. thank God you have. Thank God you have. I think that that's key. You know, um, a lot of families, especially when we're talking about, uh, I'll just speak from from the culture that I, that I identify with, the, the Black community. A lot of times parents really don't know that a there is there are people such as myself or other people such as you who are uh, advocates who have special knowledge who can attend IEP meetings with them um, they don't really understand the, the whole process they just know that there's a meeting that's that's being held at the school it's about my child who's struggling in an area and I need to attend it isn't T until they get uh, pretty far down the road and they realize that, A, this isn't working and what they're telling me is not adding up, that they may start to ask questions and may stumble upon if they, if they don't have someone um, in their circle who, who knows that this exists, um, that, that, that help is there for them to get the additional help that they need. And then, you know, that you have to deal with distrust then at that point, because it's gone from a place of, I perceived you to be a professional, I per perceived you to be an expert, but now I don't trust you because you've told me this for years that my child is doing fine, that you're working with them, that it's getting better. And to find out that it isn't, it is startling. You know, we've seen the dramatic cases in the news where uh, uh, African American athlete has gotten to college, and and we found that they're illiterate. And then we're sitting here saying, "How the heck did that happen?" Well, it happens because um, a parent is aware that their child is struggling with literacy, but they don't really understand to the level that they're struggling, especially if the school system is not being forthcoming in what's really truly happening. Right. It, it you know, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the sports analogy um, because I, I want to put something back on parents. The amount of money that we spend on extracurricular activities for our kids mm -hmm. needs to match the amount of money that we're willing to spend on making sure that they're educated. This is true. This because is so true. You, in that football analogy or that sports analogy, we tell our kids, you are one injury away from never playing that sport again. Then what? You are. You if you're are. that kid that went to college and in your sophomore or junior year of college, even senior year of college, you think you're fixing a term pro and you get hurt and that's it. Now what? Now you've wait. It's not a waste because there's experience that came out of it. But now you have nothing to fall back on. And education is something that no one can ever take away from you until they put you in the ground. That's true. That's true. You know, and um, a lot of times also on the other, other end of that, you know, you have people who, I mean, people, the United, the United States is a, a, we love sports. Okay. We all do. And when you have a gift and a talent, uh, whether it be football, whether it be basketball, um, doors open for you, mm -hmm. doors that would may not open for you educationally. And a lot of times, you know, coaches and teachers who perceive you to be an excellent athlete will overlook. Yep. They'll look the other way. Or overlook your academic struggles. They'll, they'll make ways. We'll, we'll just get a tutor. We'll have somebody help them do whatever they need to do to pass so that they can continue to play the sports. And then scholarships and, and all of those opportunities open up specifically if you're talented and you're gifted in that arena. And, you know, I know that there are pros and cons to this, but when we talk about dyslexia, some people utilize, you know, dyslexia as a weakness in a sea of strengths, which is what Dr. Sally Shaywitch put in her book, Overcoming Dyslexia. And so people who, some people who have dyslexia, you know, in the areas where they're weak, they are much stronger artistically, athletically to some degrees. It just depends. Not all are the same, but a lot. No. And so when you are weak in the area of uh, 
reading and literacy, but you, but you excel uh, physically and athletically and those doors open and those scholarships come, you know, and for a family that's in poverty or a family that, you know, really wants to see their child succeed, that's, that's a good thing for them. Right. Well, and in, in, in here, in Texas, we have no pass, no play. Oh, that's a good thing because we we have something similar here where you have to at least have a minimum GPA of a 2.5 mm. to continue to play sports. And if it, if it falls below that, then they, they, they will limit your uh, ability to play. And, and I find that it's a double-edged sword. While yes, we need to make sure that our kids are, are, are being provided the education and they are educated. They're actually uh, participating in their education. When the school isn't doing what they need to do by identifying these kids and remediating the kids that are struggling, then they're taking away, much like they did to me, they're taking away the only thing that's keeping that child in school. The yes. only thing that's keeping that child out of trouble for the most part. So that's a, that's a double-edged sword that, that cuts very deep, especially for that child that doesn't get identified or get the help that they need. And, you know, I want to jump into why these numbers are so important. You know, we're, we keep talking about these numbers. Um, the Barbara Bush Foundation did a uh, study, and they found that literacy, illiteracy in the United States cost us $2.2 trillion per year because people... And we remember we were talking about that third grade reading level. And they were yeah. saying that uh, people that read from a third to fifth grade reading level, they'll earn roughly $48,000 a year. Well, anybody that knows that's out here in the world that's working knows that $48,000 a year for a family isn't going to cut it. I mean, to, to think that there are people that are walking around today that can't read on a fifth grade level or even a sixth grade level is unbelievable. It's unthinkable. It is, I mean, I'll go ahead and say it. I would almost say that it's child abuse. It's definitely educational malpractice and educational abuse that has systemic and generational um, implications that 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 far outweigh just that particular child's educational wheelhouse. The uh, the study also said that if if we got the majority of people reading on a sixth grade level, it would be the same thing as a ten percent increase in the GDP across the United States. Yeah, you know, Stephen, you bring up when you when you when you talked about those two points two things jumped, like leaped out at me. So one of the things that I do locally is I've been working with our juvenile justice center because literacy to me is one of the main vacuum suckers of students into the school to prison pipeline. It is, if you, if you look at the uh, youth that are detained and, 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 and sitting in detention centers, and you look at their educational record, you will find that um, the recidivism rate is higher for those students who have a learning disability and or literacy issue slash dyslexia, um, that, 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 that that's, that's huge. You will also see that um, most of the students in there cannot, be, cannot read beyond a first or second grade level and then if you jump to the adult prison system where we know that 85% of all inmates are functionally illiterate and that up to 40% of those that are illiterate have dyslexia. I mean, it, it, the correlation is, is startling. We also know research wise that if we were to take those statistics that I just said, which are in our adult prisons, 
or in our detention center and that um, the recidivism rate would be about 70%, that 70% of these individuals would return to either the detention center or the adult prison system without receiving literacy uh, teaching, structured literacy, let me, let, me, let me clarify that, that if we did that, that the recidivism rate would drop to 16%. In Texas, the study showed that recidivism rate, uh, if we got these children or these, these inmates that were leaving, if we got them to a ninth grade reading level, it would save the state of Texas. I want to I say the, the, the number was $7 million per thousand, uh, per hundred prisoners uh, released. Seven million, it was a thousand. Seven, it was uh, seven million dollars per thousand inmates released. And when I started looking at these studies, again, the numbers matter. The they numbers matter. bring out the true story. And there's not enou enough of us looking at the numbers. What really just made me hit the floor is when we were looking at the study that was done in 1999 out of the um, UTMB. Million dollars per. Mm -hmm on the Texas prison system, you know, yes. it shows that over 80% are functioning illiterate, meaning that they can, like you said, they can go through day to day, but cannot read, cannot spell. Mm -hmm. And that over 50% of the inmates are dyslexic. Now, that's shocking, considering in the Texas school system, today, out of the PEMS data that that Texas has, we only show 4% of our students having dyslexia at 5.5 million kids. So how do we have 50% or more in prison, but 4% in our school system? I mean, go ahead. We, we, <laughs> I mean, it's it's one of those questions that you got to go. I'm asking the question. Somebody else, you know, raise their hand and answer it, but nobody wants to touch it, right? And that's the thing. You know, me and you were talking off off um, off show, and because we we have those type of conversations, which are valuable, invaluable, if you ask me. And and one of the things that that we were talking about is the fact that we have to have these honest conversations. For some people, they may be difficult. For some people, they may not understand why do we need to have these conversations and why does everything have to deal with numbers and why does everything always have to deal with race? And my, my short answer is to that, I, I, I wish it wasn't that way. I wish we didn't have to have these conversations. I wish that when we said literacy for all when we said that looking at the numbers you need to look at numbers that that meant that 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 meant everyone but it doesn't That's and right. when you look at numbers you see that even though literacy as a whole across the nation is subpar you know uh that it is even worse when we bring race into it and so for so, those that may be questioning why does black literacy matters matter it matters because statistically and historically it hasn't mattered it hasn't been equitable well, so we gotta we gotta bring we gotta bring black and brown children their literacy rates here so that then we can then raise all literacy rates that's right and if if we continue to bring all literacy rates down well then our ships have become useless they can't float right this right. is this is out of that study also this is the thing that just made me um it actually made me cry. So out of this study where they showed basically 50% of 
all the Texas inmates have dyslexia. In this study, the, the people that they studied. So let me ask you this question first. Clarice, out of all, the, all the, the information that you've reviewed and studied and looked at, has there ever been anything that says one race is more dyslexic than another or one sex is more dyslexic than the other? Me either. No. But here in this study, it showed um, the percentage of white people that were tested was 32.9%. Hispanics, 38.5%. Black, 63%. That's why it matters. That's Be why the numbers matter. Yeah. Because, you know, you talk about you talk about what these kids do when they can't read. We are going to, we are humans will do whatever they can do to survive. They will. So if that means, and guess what? Gangs and the street, they love everybody, especially if you're uneducated because they can lie to you and they'll suck you in. Yeah. Because the social and emotional impact of illiteracy is huge. What you feel about yourself and what you think about yourself has such a huge impact on who you will become. That's right. And it's it 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 is it is alarming that we don't recognize to the extent that we should. Now when I say we, you and I get it and a lot of other people get it, but there are a large population of people in these educational systems that don't understand the social and emotional trauma of illiteracy and what that what that what that does to you my daughter and the second and third grade would sit there and hit her head and call herself stupid over and over and over so so stop right there that right there is the reason why um we d we are our own worst bully yeah, the dyslexics yeah. are yeah. The, the people with learning disabilities, because we don't need anybody to say you're this or you're that because we, we can see what everybody else is doing. And when we don't under, or when we understand that we can't perform like them, because we haven't had the remediation to perform like everybody else, we can't lie to ourselves. We can't get away from ourselves. We can't get away from any of that. And this is just a, this is a silo when we're talking about education. We're not talking about the silo when you add in uh, your, your sex, your gender, or your, your race, or anything else, or your uh, economic status. You start adding in all of those factors too. Well, then you, you wonder why um, suicide rates for people who are dyslexic are so high. And it's so sad, you know, and then as a second grader and her sitting there hitting her head and saying, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid. I'm like, Letitia, you are not stupid. Yes, I am. Everybody else can read and I can't read. I don't know why I can't, you know, you don't know internally mm -hmm. what that does to a child, but it's traumatic and to, to go along with what you said about, you know, gangs and, and different things that are designed to pull you away when, when, when there are other factors that make you feel as if you're inadequate. And so, um, you know, the end of the, the story with my daughter, but, you know, she was 24 years old and she attended a house party and there were gang members that decided to come to this party. And they decided to shoot. They were shooting at each other. And my daughter was there at the age of 24 years old. And uh, she was shot in the back of the head and she was killed almost instantly. Changed my life forever. But I couldn't help but think about the fact that learning about the suspects who uh, were interviewed and, and some say were the, 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 the shooters that ultimately took my daughter's life, 
they struggled with they struggled in school they had dropped out they had been in the detention center they struggled with literacy issues and it i can't help as a dyslexia consultant as the mother of a daughter with dyslexia i can't help but believe that if we had addressed their issues my daughter might still be here today i have no doubt if your daughter if, if we would have not only addressed those young men's uh, needs, but the needs of your daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it took, it took, it took me advocating for her it, it, to the fourth grade for, she was in school from pre-K to fourth grade. So essentially they had five to six years with her in the traditional public school. And they continued to tell me they were doing the very best they could do for her. And the very best they could do for her was she couldn't read three simple two and three letter words. And it wasn't until I became empowered after many, many meetings. Uh, I was a young parent, 19 years old at the time, and trying to navigate a system, trying to erase what I perceived school to be, it was a shock to me. I perceived that if a person, a child went to school, that teachers and administrators and psychologists, they were the experts and that they could teach her. And I had to learn that just because you send your child to the school does not mean that they have the educational wherewithal to do the job appropriately. I had to figure that out. And once I was armed with that information, I began to look outside the traditional public school. And then I took her out of the public school, put her in a private school where they use the Orton-Gillingham method. And in one year, she went from a non-reader to a third grade reader. And the traditional public school had her for five years and she couldn't do that. Wow. And then to see her social and emotional behavior change to, I'm smart, I can do this. Yes, you can, to reading street signs as we drive down the street. But she didn't have that, 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 that confidence prior to that. And so then you couple that with, well, how do these kids end up in the school to prison? How do they end up on, in gangs? Or how do they end up doing this? I had a gang member in the detention center who I was uh, screening for dyslexia. And he said, do you know the, the way that I learned how to say B and D, the difference between the two? He said, because they had always confused me. He said, because I was getting initiated into the gang, the Bloods, and I needed to know how to spell Bloods. So I began to really, really hone in on which direction to make the B. And he said, but I want to learn to read. Isn't it sad that it takes being put in prison and it's i get i would almost think that it's a level of pain you know being put in prison allows people to stop and reflect and listen and at that point that inner person that inner child that was that was um picked on and pushed out of the education system mm -hmm. now has an opportunity to finally say, Hey, I need, I need to know how to read because everybody around me can't read. So the vulnerability vulnerability comes out. Mm -hmm. It's okay to ask for help at that point because right. everybody here can't read or the majority of people. Right. And there have been so many missed opportunities within the traditional educational system for it to be addressed. You know, one of the youth in the detention centers, he said to me, he said, I know that I couldn't read and my teachers knew that I couldn't read, but I wasn't going to sit there and say in front of all my friends that I can't read when everybody that should know knew. Right. He said, so I didn't want to so I would do what I needed to do to get out of class. When I knew that we were going to do something when it concerned reading, I just would skip. Skip. I had to go. Mine was go to the nurse. 
Yeah, or I would tell them I'm sick, I want to go home, or I would mm -hmm. do something that I know that would get me put out of class. It was like because I was frustrated. And yeah. my daughter, the same way, she went from being, a, you know, on, on the school records, a joy to have in class. But as she became older, third grade, fourth grade, her behaviors begin to escalate. And so the focus shifted from the fact that she couldn't read to the school system to we need to put her on our behavior intervention plan, her ADHD, and she's disruptive. She's being disruptive because she doesn't want to be in a classroom where she doesn't understand what's happening because she can't read anything. She has no supports in here. She doesn't want her peers to know that, but they do know that. They're, they're, they're laughing at her. So in order to make herself feel um, less singled out, she will take on the persona of, I just don't want to be here. This is stupid. It's less so painful. It doesn't look stupid. Yeah, it's less painful yeah. to get in trouble and act out or be the class clown yeah. than it is to have everybody in the room look at you like, you can't read? Right. I mean, think about that. It is less painful for a child to get in trouble every day, get kicked out of school, get spankings at home, go through all of this emotional trauma than to have the people sitting in the room with them, their peers, to know that they can't read. That is, that is spot on. That's exactly how my daughter felt. That's exactly how many students that I know that I've been in contact with, that's how they feel. So, you know, we're going to continue with the numbers. And, I, and the reason why I want to continue with these numbers, because these numbers really show the real uh, issue that we're talking about is the inequality in education. <clears throat> so I pulled some, inf I pulled some um, data from the PEAMS um, informational system here in Texas. Mm -hmm. Our state assessment um, for high schoolers, English one is EOC, which is, stands for end of course. We have uh, three different categories, four different categories. Did not meet standards, approaching standards, which still means you didn't pass, meets and masters. when we look at the different breakdown in races, 11% of Hispanics meets expectations. 14% of whites, 7% uh, black, 19% white, and 14% uh, two or more races. Now, when we go back to uh, did not meet, 70% Hispanic, 66% white, 74% black, 65% Asian, 68% two or more races. And this is, this is ninth grade English. The numbers don't lie. They do not. And like we said at the beginning, Stephen, it's just not a Texas thing. It's just not a Nebraska thing. So that's why, you know, when I when I've created Black Literacy Matters, it's a national issue. It's not it's not just isolated to Texas. It's not just isolated to Nebraska. This is a persistent systemic equity issue. And English in the state of Nebraska to correlate with what you just said for eighth graders was 4% proficiency, four. So we're, we're close here. You're 4%. <laughs> so as a freshman in high school, you would do the EOC English one. This is seven. That's horrible. Th they were zero. 0% mastered across the state. 
and, and you can go to the TEA website and look at the data yourself. I'll put links to it in the in this show. Please do. Don't don't take our word because we we we've, we told you at the beginning of the broadcast that it's imperative that you do your research and you do that. And and trust we are very careful to put information data uh, statistics out here without knowing what we're talking about. But it's imperative that you do your own. Look it up. See what we're saying is true so that you understand why we speak and advocate like we do. And we need you all to join us so that we really bring about the changes, the necessary changes that should have been happened 15, 20 years ago, if not at the beginning. I, I would even say that it's even longer than that. I, I would say so, too. I just was trying to be hopeful. I mean, I'm not uh, we're not going to sit here and say everything's doom and gloom. However, yeah. if we don't get busy now. You know, you talked about our children can't wait. We have 13 years K through 12 to get our children ready for college and going out in our world. If our children aren't identified until third grade, they've had four years of failure. K through third. And then a lot of times our parents are fighting well into middle school and high school to get our kids, their kids identified. Now what? Who is held responsible for that gap in identification? And then here's the even, here's, here's the companion to what you said just there is that then for those that are, are awakening to this issue, it has become an early literacy issue. And so it does nothing for these students that are already within the system who are beyond third grade, who have been victimized by our educational malpractice. And I know those are strong and words. Those are strong words, but I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. Me? You know, you, you, you sit and you try to be nice and, 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 uh, want, you want to work together and, and you want to collaborate and everything else. But when the ship is going down, we need everybody on deck bailing it out. We need, we need to be getting the water out of the ship, right? We need this thing to float. So and we have, and we can't, and I, I just want to say this too, cause you know, you are just me and you, it's just it's vibing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so another thing is this, is that then we have these campaigns for grade level reading, and I'm not saying that all campaigns for grade level reading, that is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that a lot of reading campaigns um, that I see school supporting, et cetera, all have to do with parents reading to your kids. And, and I'm saying, number one, what if these parents can't read? Absolutely. And you're telling them to read to their kids. Have we have we thought about that? That that's a that's a factor. And then secondarily, have we given students students read at home? This reading time. If you read twenty minutes a day, do they have the skills needed to read? Students read at home twenty minutes a day, but if it takes them an hour or two hours to read that 20 minute passage, guess what they're going to do? They're going to go figure out something else to do. They are. So before we get to the reading at home, which is good, not knocking that, we have to first make sure that we have given students the tools needed to successfully read and or when we, before we put the burden on the parents, because listen, for parents and grandparents, because some of these some of these students don't live with mom and dad. They don't. They live with a grandparent. And some of these grandparents, it was far, it was far more important for them to go out and provide for their families than going to school. So they may not have the skills needed to read. So before we sit up here and we start uh, blaming parents or households, they are entrusting us to give their students educationally what they may themselves not have. Well, and on top That's of that, why they send them. so I'll, I'll, I'll add on top of that, parents, if you are 
one of us that couldn't read, struggled to read, can't spell, whatever, you should you should tell the school system or your ISD, your campus, this information. Hey, I am one of those people that can't read or spell. Just be forthcoming with it. So and not that's ashamed. Out of, yeah, not a shame. That's get gets that out of the way. Now we're on a, an, a, a level playing for field that everybody understands where everybody's coming from. And I think here in America, we tend to not listen to the other side. And that's where the race piece of this comes in, right? We tend to not look to the other side, and I say the other side, because I don't see it as the other side. Because when my uh, black, brown, uh, Asian, whatever color brothers and sisters don't succeed, well, then that makes all of us fail, right? And thankfully, you, thankfully you, you see like that because there are some people, unfortunately, that don't. So for people like yourself and others that do get it, it, it it's, it's definitely uh, music to my ears and uh, gives us hope for humanity. You know, there's so many wonderful people out here that exist that, that believe in equality and in equity. It's just the those and the systems that exist that don't that need to be uh, challenged to do and be better. Well, Maya, Maya Angelou says we know better, we have to do better, right? Absolutely. That's the reason why we use these numbers. So you know, so let's do better. And, we must do better. And that means these conversations have to happen. And... and there are some people that would think it's an uncomfortable conversation. It's not an uncomfortable. The uncomfortable conversation is um, talking about the kids that end up in prison or the graveyard, the missed opportunities, the missed lives. Those yes. are uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations. This conversation about how we teach kids to read, that's not uncomfortable. It's only uncomfortable if you're not on the right side of it. Exactly. So, and really understanding that, because again, there are so many great organizations out here who wholeheartedly believe in literacy for all. However, we, we also need to understand that that doesn't correlate within these inequitable systems. And until this foundation, until that system is equalized, the supplemental supports and advocacy for all concerning literacy will not be equitable. It will not be fair. And I think the first thing to do is to ask the question, why? The question, why? Why is the black pass rate at seven and the white at 14? and the Hispanic at this, why is it? And look at all the different reasons why that could be. Mm -hmm. Are schools funded properly? Mm -hmm. Every school. Are our teachers educated properly? Are our administration and our school boards spending the money in the most appropriate way to answer the question, is this the best thing for the children that's the first question mm -hmm. if they can answer that with where they're spending the money the curriculum that they're buying the education that they're providing if they can't answer yes well then we need to go back to the drawing board yes we do and we need to also ensure that you know teacher the lens of the teachers is accurate you know, what cultural biases do they have? Uh, what are their, what are some inaccurate perceptions that they have? Um, you know, because sometimes teachers will say, you know, well, I didn't share this information with the family because I didn't think that they could afford to, to do this or they couldn't, or they would have access to, to get the child to A, B, C, or D or whatever. So access to resources is, is another reason. You know, self-fulfilling prophecies of, of, of teaching. 
Um, you know, there's been multiple studies where a teacher, uh, two groups have been identified and one teacher is told that every student you have in here is uh, below grade level and um, they really don't have the cognitive ability to, uh, to meet the, the teaching that you're giving them. And then you give another set of, te of, of a, a teacher with a classroom and you tell her everyone in here is brilliant. Their, their IQs are very, very high. You're going to have, uh, this should be an easy class to teach. And, and, and behind the scenes, it's, it's the opposite. And even though that teacher doesn't know that, that teacher is teaching with the perception and the lens that she's teaching to students who are academically successful. And you see that the rate of those students soars. But they, for all intents and purposes, were below average students. But it raised their level academically because of the belief of the teacher. So how the teacher perceives the student is huge. Well, we, we as taxpayers, uh, and I tell parents this all the time, we as taxpayers, we fund the school system. We're we paying for this. So we need to demand better. We need to support our teachers a whole lot better. We do. We need to make sure that our class sizes are in a manageable uh, size, that the teacher can do their job. We need to quit testing our kids to death. Because if you're not doing anything with those da that data, that, those numbers... Because the numbers I'm looking at are not good. So who else is looking at this? Nobody, I mean, seriously, nobody else can look at these numbers and go, yep, we're right on track. So we... Oh, but they do, Stephen. They uh, look at yeah. them and they say, oh, it's not us. It's not our curriculum. Well, that's where, that's where us as parents and taxpayers have to come in and, and be the voice for all kids and make sure that all the ships are rising with that high tide. We need to make sure that all kids are educated and given the opportunity and the choice to go out and do whatever they want to do. That's so key. These are our students. And one thing that has become abundantly clear here um, locally and probably around the nation is that a lot of times when parents are being vocal and they're going to their school board meetings and all of that, you have people within these systems who disregard the voice of the parents and what they're demanding and asking for. And I think it's about time that a lot of these educational systems really understand we are giving you our most precious commodity. That's right. Our students, and we are entrusting them to you and our concerns matter. Uh, our questions of you are important and they don't need to be dismissed. And when we find areas such as this, where we have the information that shows us how to do this better and scientifically that has the evidence to back it, it shouldn't be an argument if kids are truly first that's right well and i'll i'll wrap this up with um something that we say at the end of every one of our our 504 meetings i look at everybody that's sitting around the table and i say i want you to hold my child responsible as a student i want you to hold me responsible as a parent because i'm going to hold each and every one of you responsible as educators and administrators to educate my child. Is that fair? That's good stuff. And everybody goes, absolutely. So now we're all on the same page. They know I, I mean business. I know that they mean business and we're going to do what is the best thing for my child. And I'm going to make sure that they do the best thing for all kids, because much like you, it doesn't take me any more effort or energy to advocate for each and every child 
than what it does to advocate for my child. Because what's good for my child is good for everybody behind them. So I want to tell you, thank you so much for all you do. You're an amazing person. I'm, I'm so proud to know you and stand beside you in this uh, fight for our children. And, um, you know, keep doing all that you're doing. You're an amazing person. Thank you, Stephen. And again, I'm so grateful to have you as an ally. And uh, any anything that we can do to ensure that the education for all and the equity for all is, is paramount, um, I'm here for. Appreciate you and I thank you for what you've done. I thank you that you used your life's experience to be a voice for generations. It's so needed. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, it's true. I, I couldn't allow that much trauma and pain from myself and my parents, and my family to be wasted. So that is the reason why um, I have no problem standing up and, t and, and telling my life story and talking about the painful side of it so others don't have to go through it. So again, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm so proud to know you. The same here. So um, again, you know, we are, we empower dyslexia is so honored that that we get to do this show because this show isn't about empower dyslexia this show is about each and every one of you that is watching and listening this is all of us and it's an honor to sit up here and do it each and every week and we we want to tell people that don't wait if you think that there's a problem or there's struggling going on in school, don't wait to get your child tested. Don't allow uh, your, your campus or your school district to push the testing or identification off. The, the identification process should um, be very simple. You turn in a request for testing under IDEA, special education for uh, suspected uh, disabilities and there it starts the clock on getting your child tested if you need a template for this letter we have one on our website it's empowerdyslexia.org you can go there download the template turn it into your school counselor <clears throat> you'll be happy that you did and your child will be happy they'll be less stressed in school um, the last thing I want to talk about real quick is a virtual conference that uh, Learning Ally is putting on on Jul uh, June 4th, 2021. Uh, it's a full day of professional learning. You can earn up to 12 CE credits. Again, that's June 4th, 2021 from 9 a.m. Central to 5 p.m. Central. Um, the great thing about this is if you can not attend the live sessions, it'll be available on demand until December 1st. And we have our own discount code. Uh, for the premium pass, which is $99, if you use SPOD, S-P-O-D, Empower, when you register, you can get up to, you can get $20 off your registration fee of that $99. We're going to actually be there in a virtual booth so you can stop by and, and meet the Empower Dyslexia team. And for the first hundred that use that registration code, that discount code, SPOD, S-P-O-D, Empower, we're giving away a hundred Empower Dyslexia shirts. So I want you to make sure that you register quickly and you can uh, get one of these shirts. They've got some great keynote speakers. Andrew Lewis, who is a Olympic sailor. David Kilpatrick, who needs really no introduction. And Dr. Susan Hall, again, has it doesn't need any introduction. So until next time, here's a word from our sponsors.
Learning Ally is a proud sponsor of the Empowered Dyslexia podcast. At Learning Ally, we are always looking for new ways to engage readers struggling with a reading deficit like dyslexia and help them work to their potential. Visit www.learningally.org to learn about the Learning Ally audiobook solution, including which of your students are eligible for access. If you live in Texas, we have great news. The Texas Education Agency provides access to the Learning Ally audiobook solution for all K-12 public and charter school students with reading deficits. Get started today by visiting www.learningally.org.